thanks Nate. Um, thanks, thanks to the organizers. This is always very fun. Um, well, so so yeah, so this is joint work with uh, Takako Matsu. He's in um, Xi'an, and Jose Luis Ramirez in Universidad Nacional de Colombia. And I'm sorry that I'm not going to talk about primes as the other talks, but okay, let's see. So I want to motivate um, the study of this by this by this little old friend. So probably we all have seen this summation at one point in our life um, by, I don't know, by, by curiosity or I don't know, in CAC2 or something like that. Um, so it's, it's the sum of the first 10 numbers. So, and what people tell you the first time that you look at it in a class or something is that uh, what you can do is you can reverse the integers and sum uh, like the first one with the last one, the second one, the second to last one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you do that, you get that if you add these columns, you get every time n plus one. And because you have n summons, you get n times n plus one. So these, thing, these numbers have, have a name and they have uh, a, bon a, a bunch of things. But then your professor gets greedy and then he asks, okay, or she asks, what about um, I square? And then you cannot do the same thing. But if you, um, like if you allow yourself some, some geometrical meaning, perhaps you can come up with the, with the answer, which is, is not as nice as the, as the first one, but, but you can do it. But I'm gonna tell you about a different trick to solve this kind of, of sums. So what happens in the general case? What happens if you want to add i to the power of j? So the first trick that you, that you do, oh, I'm, I'm gonna do the, the trick for just x to the power of two, and then I'm gonna tell you about the, the general trick. But for x uh, squared, if you imagine a square, um, then x squared is like the, the area of the square. So you can imagine um, adding first the diagonal uh, points in the, in the square, and then adding the upper and the, the lower um, like triangular points in that square. So you get in the diagonal x elements, and in the off diagonals, you get two times x choose two uh, points. H, x choose two just meaning you choose um, like, one of the coordinates is less, less than the other, and you multiply by two because you want the two triangles. So you get this here. The second trick that um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna just announce is this is this beautiful formula, which is called the hockey stick formula, and it's called the hockey stick formula because if you draw the the Pascal triangle, you see like a hockey stick um, when you do when you do this this kind of stuff. So like the left hand side, you're just going down in the triangle. And the right hand side is just you go in the opposite way one one more one more time. Okay, so it's essentially uh, you add over the the upper part of the binomial, and then you get um, the last term that you add plus one, and then you get this this term plus one. Okay, and then you can also try to kind of imagine geometrically what what is happening, or you can create a story that tells you the story of this of this equation. Okay. Okay. Oh wait, this is not passing anymore. Okay, so wait. Okay, okay. So you get now the the the, the general thing. So so let's use these two tricks that we that we just, just discussed. So if you use the first trick, um, you get that i squared is is i choose one plus two i choose two. And then you use the second trick and then you add this and you get this and then you add this and you get that, okay? So this is very simple to remember, not the, not the big formula that they, they usually tell us, this is much simpler to remember. So now you get greedy. Now you say, okay, what is the, what if I change the two by an N or by a K or by a J or by whatever I want? So the question is, can I write X to the power of N as the sum of X choose K times some sequence of numbers? Uh, if so, what are these numbers? Okay, so that's the question. Uh, and the answer is yes. So how do you do it? You imagine your left-hand side. So your left-hand side was x to the power of n. And that's the amount of functions that go from n to x. Where this little box means the numbers from one to n. And this little box means the numbers from one to x. So just, just for now, imagine that x is uh, an integer, okay? But in the right-hand side, so let me check. In the right-hand side, there was an x choose k. So you're choosing something from the codomain of the, of the function. What are you choosing? What does it make uh, sense to, to choose? Well, the range of the function. If you, if you imagine that you're choosing something from the codomain, 
is because it should be something related to a function. And what is related to a function in the codomain is the range of the function. So you choose the range of function. So that means that the coefficient that is accompanying um, that expression should be the number of ways that you can form functions from n to the now to the range in a surjective manner. Okay. So essentially, uh, a function can can be split into um, a surjective part. Yeah, I mean a surjective part, uh, as like an injection and a surjection in some, in some sense. Okay. So that's how how you imagine that that expression there. But of course, then when you imagine surjective functions, what you're actually doing is you're taking the codomain and you're partitioning it into, into k. No, you're, sorry, sorry, you're taking the domain and you're partitioning it into the number of elements in your range. And what you're going to do with that partition is every set of the partition, you're going to send it to one of the possible uh, images. Okay. So this concept of set partition comes, comes there. And so just to remind you, uh, the little box is just going to be the numbers from 1 to n. And um, this set partition, let's see just the example, just means that you take, uh, say, for example, eight, so the numbers from one to eight, and then uh, you write that set in, um, in different parts, and the parts being um, subsets of, of eight, such that they are the joint uh, one by one, and uh, the union of them is the whole H, and none of them is empty, okay? You can take this partition and you can write it down as list, which is very helpful. And so this little bar represents just the commas. So like it's changing the block and you write the elements of the blocks, the elements of the, of the blocks in increasing order. And then you put in increasing order the first element of the blocks. Okay, so in, in, in this particular case, the first elements are one, two, three, and six, which is one, two, three, and six. And then you put them in order. Okay, and you call this set in red, the minimal elements of the partition P. Okay, okay. So associated with this, with this concept, one wants to count uh, how many of these there are, and then some, some numbers, corresponding numbers of the second kind appear. Um, they are essentially denoted by this curly bracket. This is um, Canute's notation of, of that. And then what you do is you take all of the partitions of a set X, and you just, uh, you just stick with the, with the ones that says size K, okay? The ones that have exactly K, K parts. And you call the cardinal of that set the Stirling numbers. Okay. Um, you have some recursion associated, which makes you easy to compute. And for example, four two means um, all of the partitions of four. So notice that every element uh, has four elements and there is just one di di divisor, which means um, there are just two blocks. So in particular, four two is seven, okay. So associated to this, to this concept, they come in pairs. So one is the second one and one is the first kind. They come in pairs because they have certain relation, which is, is called orthogonality that we're going to see in a sec. But then, um, so the, the expression that we were trying to analyze to, to come up with a formula was this. No? So we know now what, what the coefficients are, the a and k, which is n k k factorial. And now we, we, will leave, we will really want to analyze this polynomial that appears here. This just comes from the binomial coefficient, okay? If you divide by k factorial and multiply by k factorial, this will, will be the binomial coefficient, okay? So what is that? So um, this expression over here, you can call it the following factorial and it's called the following factorial because it's going down. So x, x minus one up to x minus n plus one and it's denoted by a little bar under the x, okay? And what happens when you multiply all these all these all these monom all these uh, monomials, you get um, you get coefficients. These coefficients are called the Stirling numbers of the first kind, and it's a happy coincidence of life of life that um, these numbers count permutations on M with exactly LD joint cycles. And I'm saying coincidence because uh, if you partition a permutation in cycles, you're essentially doing a partition too. Okay, so they they come in pairs, one without order and one with order. Okay. And they come in pairs exactly because of this orthogonality. So if you were to write down this polynomial completely, you will see that this relation will come, will, will come handy to understand why at the left-hand side there is just one monomial and it's uh, some kind of orthogonality. So this is the Dirac Delta. So it's just uh, one when N is equal to N, which corresponds to the coefficient of X to the power of N. Okay, so they come two by two. Awesome, so what about the sum? 
So we started with the sum, and now we, we have a general L, a general J. So what we do is we express L to the power of J as, as we just saw. So the stealing numbers comes there and the binomial comes there. And then you do what you do with sums. You exchange the, 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 the summations, you know, kind of Fubini uh, thing. So when you exchange them, exchange them, you get this, okay? And then we show you this little trick. It was trick two. In trick two, you were adding over the first component of the binomial, of the upper component of the binomial, and you were getting n plus one, k plus one. Okay. And up to that point, that's all we can say. And then you'll say, okay, Diego, you went from a, a very nice sum to a horrendous sum. Yeah, that has a lot of terms. Uh, so what's up with that? Uh, what's up with that is that now you're adding over j. You're not having over, over n. So n can be as big as you want, but perhaps j was small. So perhaps j was four or five, okay? So for example, here is for j equals three, what's up, okay? So if you remember, probably you don't remember, but if, if someone showed you an expression for one cube to n cube, and it was something that I just, I don't know by hand, but at this, this, this can I remember, okay? So if you, have, you need to remember these kind of things, this is a good way, but still not, not quite the best way to remember this. Okay, so the next question would be, can we do better than that? At least remember better, okay? Perhaps you cannot compute better, but perhaps you can remember more about these things. And then you, you, you will go back to your memories on calculus. I don't know if those are good memories or bad memories, but uh, you go back to your, your, your calculus one, calculus two, and then you remember this. This was the nicest thing about calculus one and the nicest thing about calculus two. It's pretty easy, and it's like the derivative thing. So it's pretty nice. So why does the summation of, of so like if you replace the, the integral sign by just the summation sign, is that ugly? It should be a formula that resembles this, 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 this nice structure. And the answer is yes, there is, a, there, is, there is something going on there. If you remember the last part of your calculus too, which probably now is a bad memory, uh, that last part has like the difference in between taking an integral and taking a sum. And there's something that they call their euler maclaurin summation, okay? And then uh, some numbers come in very handy. And those numbers are called Bernoulli numbers, okay? So Bernoulli numbers appear in a lot of different contexts. And they are kind of complicated numbers in, in their arithmetics, but they're very nice numbers for combinatorics. They come in pairs too. There is some uh, numbers called Genocchi numbers that come with these B, B numbers that uh, they appear later. But I'm talking about numbers and then in this, um, in this expression, I have a polynomial on X, okay? This is the generating function of these uh, Bernoulli polynomials and they appear in this uh, euler maclaurin expansion, okay? And so if you remember, you go back to your calculus too, then you know that the difference in between the integral and the sum is that. And so there should be a way to express the summation of this in terms of, of this Bell number. And in fact, there is. So there is a theorem uh, due to Bernoulli, uh, it's called Fallhavers, it's one of the part of Fallhavers. And I'm also putting Bell because there is Stirling numbers. I actually have no idea of the history of this, of this thing. Uh, perhaps if Victor is in the audience, he can, he can let us know. But so you have this, and then at the end, uh, this summation can be expressed as some kind of integral, the integral of these of this Bernoulli polynomials, okay? These I can remember, this is very nice, okay? And now comes, comes the question. We want to study this, 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 this expression here that looks like, that like, like an integral, okay? So um, what happens is that now we're jumping a hundred years in time, uh, Mirke Amerka uh, in 2014, he found a way to express these Bernoulli polynomials or this integral of Bernoulli polynomials in terms of the stealing numbers of the two kinds. And so this kind of an orthogonality relation, which is pretty, pretty nice. It's just like shifting by J, the orthogonality um, condition, the orthogonality property and multiplying by L. So there is kind of a derivative there and anyway. So now what at least I'd like to do, I, I call it the, the numerology of math. I like to put um, some numbers in, in formulas and see what happens. And, that's what I've learned here. And so, so that's what I do. So I would like to understand what happens if you change that one over here, okay? That's the whole point. So then um, other numbers come very handy. 
So remember that uh, we express x to the power of n as a sum of, of some rise of, of some falling factorials. What we can do is we can take out these falling factorials and express it as multiplication of, of two falling factorials. Those are called the central factorials, and they're called the central factorials because you are going down and up. So you put half of them uh, above x and half of them below x. Okay. And uh, it happens also that you can express these numbers in these polynomials in these polynomials. And so there should be some coefficients that relate to each other. These coefficients are the central factorial numbers of the second kind. Okay. And so um, notice that for, for at least this central factorial, you can express this polynomial as a multiplication of x squared minus j squared. And because it's a polynomial, you can change the, the variable to have x squared equals some c or some y or something. So the only importance is j to the power of two, okay? So then comes the curiosity. What happens if you, if you change uh, j to the power of two to j to the power of s for a generalist? What happens to those relations of Merck? Okay, do they change? That's, that was the motivation of this work. The second motivation of this work is do, they, do these things have any, any combinatorial interpretation? Okay? And if the combinatorial interpretation will tell us something about the Bernoulli polynomial. Okay? And the question, the answer is yes. So in 2004, uh, essentially in 1974 and 2004, there was these uh, two, 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 two people, uh, Dumont in, I think it's French, and Domaratsky, which I think is from here, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, so they study uh, these numbers TS. And so Domaratsky proposed uh, a recursion for them. And Dumont was studying uh, Genocchi numbers, which are related to Bernoulli numbers. And they found that actually there is a, an interpretation for these numbers. And this representation is, is as follows. You consider something called quasi-permutation. And so a quasi-permutation is a subset of n times n, such that um, that subset is, has to be equal uh, to the excedence of, of, of a sigma, okay? So you take a, you take a permutation sigma, and you compute the excedence. The excedence is when the image is bigger than the, than the pre-image of that permutation. And if your, if your, if your P was, was one of those, of those sets, it's called a quasi-permutation, okay? It's almost a permutation. And what you do is you put these permutations in a tuple. So you construct an S tuple of those, of those numbers, of those, uh, of those sets, and uh, you put some conditions. The conditions being that the sizes of these, of these quasi-permutations are all the same, equals to n minus k for some k fixed. And then the, the right component of, notice that the sets are constructed by tuples. So the right component, meaning the images of the permutation, they will have to agree, okay? So this is very complicated. Um, it's a very complicated uh, interpretation and I mean, it, there is no much one can do to expect uh, to say something about this, this beautiful formula for, for Merck. So what we did was the following. So we essentially took this uh, recurrence and we tried to construct uh, something that we know. If you take this S out, this looks like the recursion of Stirling numbers, okay? So the idea is to try to construct some interpretation in terms of the Stirling numbers. So we, we, we define the stealing numbers of second high, of second kind with a higher level. And we define it as a tuple of partitions such that the size uh, of the partition is exactly K. So K is fixed. And the minimal set of each partition is the same. Okay, so notice that this should be very reminiscent of the condition that the sizes of the quasi permutations are all the same and the right components are all the same. Okay. <clears throat> so you get that. And um, so we call the numbers to be the, the cardinal of this set, okay? So for example, this one is counted by eight, four, three, because there are three of them, S is three, so there are three of them. The four is the number of blocks of each one, and they will have to have the same minimal set of the, of the partition, okay? If you see the red points in the three components are the same, okay? So the beautiful coincidence, or not a coincidence because we set it up like that, so, the beautiful non-coincidence is that these two numbers agree and one can prove it with the recursion, but that's not that fun. So one can make a picture and, and, and explain how the, the two, the two combinatorial interpretations agree. So what you do is you take um, our interpretation. So you put the, the partition in this order that we discussed uh, like 10 minutes ago, 
And what you do is you take two by two, the elements. And you take two by two the elements and you put them in a set in which you put like this one in the left and this one in the right. If you see, the only element that does not appear in this set is the minimal element of each block, okay? That's the only element that does not appear in the right component of this set, okay? And that's reminiscent of the minimal set being equal, okay? Because it, do, it doesn't appear, okay? And the sizes, and the, like the size of this set, if you add the elements here, because um, the first element is not appearing, you are doing n elements in total minus the minus, minus the minimal, which is k. So you get n minus k. So you get n minus k with the right, uh, with the right uh, component being equal, okay? Now how do you go back? You take, uh, say, uh, quasi permutation, and you, what you do is you, you paste them together, okay? So for example, AB is there and BC is there. So what you do is you recognize that the right component of AB in the left component and BC is the same. So you just glue them together. You glue them together, and then there are some of them that don't appear because the minimal don't appear. So perhaps they are a singleton there. So you push the, the singletons that don't appear. So E is never here, but E is before uh, G and after A. So E has to be there somewhere, okay? So you put it there. And that's a rejection. So you go further and you go backwards. And so these two numbers are the same. Diego, uh, yep. uh, it's uh, over three, over two minutes. So you wanna wrap up in one minute? Awesome, yeah. Okay, uh, so the beautiful coincidence is that you can actually do the same for, for permutations. So you can put the same condition for, for permutations, except that you don't put partitions, you put permutations, and this orthogonality um, is satisfied, okay? And so the punchline is that Merca in, in 2016 extend this, 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 this kind of like expanded orthogonality to put the twos here, so in the arithmetics, there is now a two instead of a one. And then the right numbers to multiply are uh, the, the higher levels with two, okay? And what we did was we just extend from a two to S. So um, now you have uh, up to two, but you can put uh, up to S, okay? And that's, that's, I mean, I guess it's a long formula, but I think it's pretty cute. So thanks. <laughs>